Anybody hear that? I'm fairly alarmed here. Come on, come on, come on. We gotta get out of here. We gotta get out And welcome back to the Knights of Krishna. Tonight I'm joined by my good buddy Anthony Chioza. And tonight we're going to be talking about, well, something we've covered a few times here on the Knights of Krishna, and that is religious indifferentism and the concept of American religious liberty, which is, well, a big problem as we've highlighted so many times here at the KOC. Uh, particularly right now, we have a situation in the state of Arizona, Scottsdale, Arizona, where a satanic group of the satanic temple is challenging sort of a, a government mandate and suing the government there for not being allowed to really practice their religion publicly and in sort of having equal rights with those of Christian denominations. Uh, Anthony, I've been kind of following the story for a while now. Um, they're simply claiming, listen, they have just as much religious rights as any Christian organization. If the Christian organization is going to place their Ten Commandments up on some city hall uh, building, why shouldn't they be allowed up? Uh, you know, to basically um, set up their own, you know, satanic icons on government lands as well, too, Anthony. You know, Frank, that's a million dollar question. Why not? I mean, why not? I mean, isn't that the society that's been created? Isn't that what uh, the founders have handed us, the infallible founders of the Constitution? Um, yeah, when we start digging into this, Frank, it just you start to connect all the dots and all the things that are absolutely wrong in our Western civilization, and specifically here in the United States. That's why we're always saying that we need a confessional state here in the United States, because it opens up the question, what exactly is religion? Yeah, and that's the question being asked here, because this thing went to a court case, and the judge asked, really, the you know the, the Christian side of the argument here, well, how do we define what a religion is? And there's been uh, sort of some tests and measures, I guess you could say, over different courts. There was a court case back in the late 60s that dealt with the concept whether religion is just reduced down to theism or do other religions like Buddhism and, and, and things like that, some Eastern religions, do they qualify as religions? And of course, they do qualify as religions in the in American kind of way. But defining what a religion is, um, that's more complex. And I think that's part of sort of the religious indifferentism that we see. I mean, you know, the point I've been making here for a long time is what the actual, you know, Constitution does through the concept of, you know, sort of religious liberty and this religious indifferentism where everybody is allowed to worship as they see, to concoct their own personal moral codes. It's actually made religion into a superstition because we see all the contradictory factions, uh, Anthony where everybody gets to pick and choose what they want, and there is no cohesion within society as a result. Of, it's why I've been saying for a long time, everything that's actually wrong with America today ultimately comes down from this broken ideology of religious liberty that refuses to define who and what God is because they've rejected sacred tradition, Anthony. Yeah, I have to agree, Frank. And, and, and the thing is, is the, the Catholic Church has defined what religion is really. And in the rebellion against the Church five centuries ago, whether you're talking about Protestantism or the Enlightenment, the rebellion against the Church has opened up this question once again. And it's funny because you have to kind of take the whole thing in historical context. So... It's not necessarily that uh, religions that are pagan in origin are bad per se. They do have elements of truth. But what the West has done in rejecting the Catholic Church is that it has opened up the question again. And look, the origin of religion, you know, it, it's all we can really do when it comes to the origin of religion is give kind of a speculative answer. 
Um, it's Catholic teaching that primitive religion was divinely revealed monotheism. If you think right back to the beginning uh, with Adam and Eve, you have men beginning to fall away and you get Noah's flood, and then we kind of see everybody back together again, and then we get the fall uh, of the Tower of Babel. And then at that point, men's languages are confused, and we see uh, the story of God getting kind of mishmashed again as generations go on, and some of it is actually influenced by devils, and some of it is man's mistakes. But generally, that paganism, as it moved forward through time, it does hold some true uh, elements of religion. It carries that with it. But what we've got now is we, we have come to the fruition of things, Frank, and, and with the Holy Catholic Church and uh, in the West, modern Western civilization, post-Enlightenment civil, civilization and Enlightenment civilization has rejected God's divinely revealed truth. Yeah, and that's the key, sacred tradition. And we got a situation now where post-Enlightenment, post-Protestant Reformation, we have a bunch of individuals who decided to break the original covenant with God and then proclaim <laughs> their own personal new covenants with God. This is kind of the same ideology that Glenn Beck always talks about, where you have a bunch of covenant breakers always reestablishing the terms of condition with God by creating their own new covenants, which essentially means this endless sort of you know, idea where religions are always broken apart, covenants are always broken, and religious beliefs always change to accommodate the times and to accommodate man's sins here. And this is what we've seen. It starts at the Protestant Reformation with Martin Luther and Calvin and all these guys that were very imperfect men. We've talked about Luther before here. Man has struggled mightily with his own sins here. We won't get to details tonight, but we know this as a matter of fact. And when we begin to see the breaking away of the original covenant of God that really is in play for 1,600 years, Anthony, that's the key here, where we have one consistent belief for 1,600 years, and don't give me that the church was founded in the 4th century by Constantine and and all the historical figures, the church was always there. You go back to the early fathers. They celebrated baptism as regenerational. They, they celebrated the, the, the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist. They followed their local bishops. We have an analogy of the faith that is consistent for 1,600 years up until, up until the reformers break that original covenant and concoct their own covenant out of thin air. And then you wonder why we got a mess I mean, look at the form of Christianity we have here in America. It is a kooky form of Christianity that is devoid of all of its history. And all of it contradicts itself. It's constantly splintering into different groups to where, again, it makes a mockery out of religion to such a degree. I'm telling you, the founding fathers of America made religion into a superstition, not the Catholic Church. Right. And, you know, what we've got now with this situation that's developed, Frank, there's 24 chapters of this satanic church throughout the entirety of North America. And, you know, one of these churches' uh, political goals is to advocate for the value of separation of church and state. Yeah. And, you know, their whole strategy is to remind the public that if Christians can use government resources to assert their cultural dominance, and Satanists are free to do the same. And Frank, oddly enough, this is exactly what the founding fathers created, especially when you start to get into their deistic beliefs. And a lot of Christians here in the United States will say, well, no, no, they were Christian. They were Christian. Well, you know, if we're going to talk about the Constitution, we're going to talk about this concept of freedom of religion, and all these different religions have this right to exist. We have to we have to figure out where that came from. Because if the founders were like Orthodox Christians, even if we're talking about Orthodox Protestants, then they should have left some vestige of that to us in the Constitution. But, you know, so what we have to do is actually look at the founding fathers themselves to draw out what was going on. And so there's four things we need to look at here. Um, you can differentiate a founding father influenced by deism from an Orthodox Christian believer uh, by following, you know, certain criteria. So first, 
the first thing you should ask is you have to examine that particular founder's church involvement. And then the second consideration you have to make is an evaluation of their participation uh, in that church and, and especially the sacraments of that church because you have to remember that even the, some of the Protestant churches, churches still had communion in some sense, right? And third, one should note the religious language a founder used. There were like non-Christian deists like Thomas Paine who refused to use Judeo-Christian terminology. And he described God with such expressions as providence, the creator, uh, the ruler of great events, and nature's God. So founders who fall into the category of Christian deists use deistic terms for God, but sometimes add a Christian dimension to it. And finally, the other thing you have to consider is what would, what did their friends and family say? And a good example of that is George Washington. George Washington's pastor in Philadelphia, he uh, clearly viewed Washington as influenced by deism. And Washington actually refused to take communion. He wouldn't take communion. And so that, that's a lot more evidence to show us what the founders were like than just some cloudy memories from the revolutionary they fought with, like war veterans or, you know, maybe a friend they had or something like this. This is the actual pastor, we know. So those are the four things you have to consider, Frank. And yeah. I think when you look at most of the founders, and we can go over more, but we look at a lot of them. Now, there were some that were orthodox. There were some. But many of them were influenced by these just propagandists from the Enlightenment, including John Locke. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, even those terms that you phrased, divine providence and the grand creator, all that stuff, it's all Freemasonic terms. And it's like I've argued for a long time, you know, when I've read the Founding Fathers, I see a lot of Protestantism mixed in with Freemasonry is what I see. And ultimately, that's what bastardizes a lot of their ideology. But I, too... Uh, when I read this article here, was hit by the concept that the Satanists do want the separation of church and state. And the irony there is, again, not only does that put the Satanists in the camp of the liberal progressives, but it puts them in the classical liberal camp as well, who have argued for separation of church and state. Now, now, now let's talk about this for a second, because I was in that classical liberal camp for a long time. They will say they're not in favor of separation of church and state. Well, of course they're in favor of it. Because they're not going to proclaim one church as a head over the government. They, they, their kind of concept of believing in you know church and state together, who believe that the church has some kind of a role, but the overarching principles are the secular government is always at the top of the food chain, where separation of church and state actually means that the church sets all the moral dictates. We now live in a country where the Supreme Court lays down all of our morality. It actually overrides the laws of Moses and all the prophets and the Savior himself. Okay, I keep saying, when that Oberfeld decision came down that changed marriage forever in America, and, and I know that Supreme Court had been tinkering with marriage for, for many decades, but when it, when it came down with that decision, Anthony, it basically said, you know, God, screw you. We're the Supreme Court. We're the political appointees of our time, and we're going to change your laws because we know better than you, God. That's what the Supreme Court essentially did a few years back, Anthony. So you got that factor. And you're right about the, the, the religion of founding fathers. It was a mixed bag to simply say, well, they were religious men. Okay, so what? What, what does that mean? Uh, there's a lot of religious men. Uh, you know, David Koresh was a religious man. Um, there was a lot of religious men in that sense. What you believe is just as important in believing in whatever it is you want to believe. The details matter. And this is where our classical liberal friends, Anthony, they go wrong because they themselves, in my opinion, like a certain sort of a certain faith because they never want to articulate the, the principles if there is a one triune God. And ultimately they can't. Because Protestantism is the base and the foundation of, of the American founding. And because Protestantism is mired in sectarian divisions, they can't narrow down what the one true God is. Thus, the classical liberals fall into this trap. How do you stop Satanism from becoming a big part of American religion? You can't. You can't do it. Because the classical liberals set the booby trap for themselves, Anthony. 
Yes, absolutely, they did. You can find it in the documents as well, this booby trap that you're describing. Uh, you know, that term, um, when he postulated a distant deity, uh, and we're talking about Franklin, Benjamin Franklin here, he, he denied that the Almighty ever did anything to you, anything to man by speech, language, vision. He just rejected all of it. And so he, this, he postulated this idea, though, of this distant deity that he called nature's God. And this term is also found in the Declaration of Independence. Um, uh, Thomas Paine declared uh, this in a uh, profession of faith, too. So you can see how it was set up from the beginning to fail, basically. I mean, uh, and of course we're going to have Satanism show up. Uh, now, you know, not to mention a lot of the other things that Benjamin Franklin participated in, but we'll save that for another episode because a lot of that was questionable as well. And it's history that people are not really aware of. It's pretty messed up. Um, so I think the idea these people have in their heads that the, the founders were these pious Christian men, kind of like the founding fathers, or, or, you know, it's almost like they're trying to create a new kind of... Um, religion that kind of mirrors and bastardizes Catholicism because we have the early church fathers, which really were true fathers. Yes. Uh, they, they taught us right from wrong, true right from wrong. And, you know, that, that's the thing. We just have this progressive uh, substitution of um, just we're going backwards. We're going backwards is what ha is happening, Frank. We're, we're becoming increasingly paganized here in the United States because of this, and also the scourge of just atheism and the nuns. I think, Anthony, you, part of the problem is, is that we are a pluralistic nation because we don't subscribe to any creed. And I think, I think one of the best ways you could describe the Founding Fathers and their religious belief is that they believed in conduct over creed. It doesn't matter what you believe in as long as you're a good person. And as I said so many times before, well, how do you know if you're a good person if you don't know what your creed is? Everything follows from your creed. Uh, and, and they do have creeds, right. by the way. They're just not traditional sort of Christian Catholic creeds. They've concocted their own creeds in, in that in that respect. And so this is where you get into a lot of problems. And, and it's like I've said to you so many times before, you know, when I was in the classical liberal camp for so long and the left and the right are battling out between the ideas of, you know, whatever various ideas it is, one of the big arguments when we talk about race relations, for example, is the, the, the progressive accusing their, their classical liberal siblings of, well, we've never had an open dialogue on race in this country. And I'm like, okay, we talk about race all the time. I never saw that. But I will add this. The one thing we've never talked about in this country is religion and which is the true religion. How do we define religion? classical liberals have avoided that question like the plague. And if you were to get down to the brass balls with the classical liberals and ask them what they believe, now a lot of them are good Catholics that are trying to make it work. They live in this country. We all want to be patriarch Amer Americans like I do. But a lot of those classical liberals, they really have their own defined personal moral codes that at times they'll, they'll tell you, well, that's what Jesus Christ is to me kind of a thing. And that is one of the most disturbing things about those on the right in America. Well, yeah, Frank, and, and that's why the Catholic Church recognizes the need of firmly establishing like solid grounds of theistic belief and refuting errors that weaken or destroy the virtue of religion. And that's precisely what has happened here. The virtue of religion has been weakened over time. We're running on the fumes of Christianity, true Christianity, which is Catholicism, and now we see we're breaking back down into paganism, whether it's polytheism, which kind of confounds the one true God, or, um, and then, of course, we saw this, you know, we have the ideas of pan pantheism, which is just as destructive because it views all things as emanations of kind of an impersonal, unconscious uh, world ground. We even saw that in, in shadows of that in the Amazon Synod. <laughs> it's really not outright. I mean, you know, considering what we heard from some of the cardinals talking about how we were looking at uh, a document that seemed to kind of apostatize from the faith. So this has been happening not only it's, it's as if governments 
uh, going down through history, these new Western governments that have attacked the Catholic Church, and we don't ever get in our history books the stats on the number of Catholics that were murdered in these bloody revolutions that were against Catholics. These were the first genocide that took place, yeah. my friend, and we don't get those stats, do we? We get no. brainwashed is what we get. And so, anyway, I, I'm... <laughs> Just uh, I got a little emotional there, and I've lost my train of thought. That's one of the bad things. That's okay. Well, listen, listen you're absolutely <laughs> uh, right. The genocides against Catholics yeah, have yeah. all been whitewashed from history. Why? Because they have a, a, a revolutionary element of the Enlightenment that nobody wants to talk about, okay? The the Cristados in Mexico, the Vendée in France, the Irish were persecuted the, during Catholic unification. I mean, Catholic persecution is all over history, and there is not more uh, a more persecuted group in the history of the world. Um, that being said, um, I... I you know, I lost my train of thought now, but because um, I, 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 I'm going to make a broader, thought, a broader point here, ultimately. Um, where does, okay, so where does this leave us ultimately now, Anthony? Because, listen, um, when I was, when I had my first sort of reversion to my Catholic faith back in the early 90s, I remember being in sort of a Catholic answers crowd and debating Protestants and things like that. And I remember at the time, when we Catholic kept point out is the contradiction of these 15,000 denominations, where here we are just 30 years later, Anthony, and we're up to 35 to 40,000 Protestant denominations. I mean, the Protestants and, and really the American li uh, religious liberty continues to make a mockery out of religion with all of its contradictions here. I mean, what happens here with this concept of religious liberty, you know, 20, 30 years down the line, do we get to 60,000 denominations, 100,000 denominations? And at what point does religion lose its meaning altogether? I think it already has lost its meaning altogether in the West, Frank. I think that's why we see that the West is on the verge of collapse in so many different ways. Um, you know, even tonight, Dr. Taylor Marshall tweeted out, he was wondering, is, is this coronavirus and the lack of the holy sacrifice of the mass now some kind of a punishment from God? Well, yeah, I think we're getting into some of the chastisement now, because I think that we're at a point where civilization has become so filthy and um, so mired, really, in sin, and they've We've had enough experience with Christianity in the West, even if, if it was just the fumes of Christianity, uh, as a, to know but, but that Anthony, we're rejecting God. But Anthony, but Anthony, those GDP numbers look great, man. Why are you so pessimistic? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? I should be, I should be really cheerleading the GDP. <laughs> I'm not quite sure the GDP numbers look so great right now. <laughs> <laughs> the things are looking pretty bad there too now. That's that's what's going to happen though. That's the whole that's the whole point is that we've become so Western civilization has become so uh, disordered in its thinking from throwing away the Catholic Church that eventually even the economy will collapse because if you if you look at the way that it was set up, well, what is the fundamental thinking? They threw out the Catholic morality. But whether you're looking at communism or you're looking at the classical liberal idea of capitalism, and I'm not saying like free trade or anything, any market system that Catholicism would have endorsed in the past. It could, Catholicism, according to the Saint Pope John Paul II, can endorse capitalism uh, when it meets certain criteria. But what we have right now is two systems, whether you're talking about communism or capitalism, that are purely focused on materialism. Yeah. And that... That type of thought process, ultimately, uh, it will destroy the East and the West. So I think that that's where we're at, Frank. I'm not sure there's any salvaging anything right now. Short of a divine, you know, divine providence, we get some kind of a miracle from Our Lady. We get some kind of a mass conversion where people uh, see their sin and they see that God is real and that they need to fall on their knees, uh, really. But I, I don't see how we get out of at least a minor chastisement at this point, my friend. Yeah, it's pretty tough. Um, I think Our Lady's message to um, Sister Lucy, St. Lucy, I don't know if she's been officially canonized yet, but she will be. Um, the three sins that the world will be chastised over, according to Our Lady, was impurity, impiety, and heresy. 
The impurity is rampant. There's no denying it. The impiety, we see it in the great apostasy. And of course, um, the heresy. Uh, we just refuse to define religious liberty or religious indifferentism as heresy. We're just in denial about that. Um, because mm, in democracy, listen, you got to accommodate man's sins. That's that's always been the Achilles heels of democracy, by the way, is that the people want their sins just. I mean, yeah, they want a better way of life. They want to be able to make their money and feed their families. But a lot of it has to do to accommodate um, a lot of our, our man's fallen passions. And this is why when you look at, for example, in this country alone, look at all the moral degradation that has really um, been put on steroids over the past 60 years, from abortion on demand to contraception to, you know, alternative lifestyles, uh, pornography at the fingertips of 12 year olds here. They've been given to us by our political system. Our political system is done to pacify us and to pacify our, our sort of our fallen, you know, human nature in that sense. And, and this is why when I see my fellow Catholic brothers and sisters, they're still looking to government for answers to solve these problems. I'm like, guys, the political system gave us these problems. They did. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and, and even, and listen, yeah, and, and even, look, listen, even this abortion thing, let's talk about it real quick, this abortion thing. Because so many people are excited that Trump has got all these judges in there. One more, we're going to overthrow Roe v. Wade. So what? All that means is it goes down to the state level. You're not going to stop it in New York. You're not going to stop it in California. Half this country is still going to be butchering children at will. And I'm not convinced the red states are going to stop it all completely altogether at the, at the state level, Anthony. Right, yeah, geopolitically speaking... I think the United States is about to bust apart the seams within the next decade, maybe two, because uh, there's really no way to hold this nation together anymore. Um, yeah, you might get a Supreme Court ruling on that. It goes down to the state level, and then the butchery just continues. And uh, really, it would be best at that point for many states that are at least trying to do the right thing, uh, probably to secede anyway or for those other states to maybe secede because they're unhappy with the Supreme Court, uh, that would be fine by me because, honestly, I don't want the full chastisement. I'd rather not have the full treatment because I, I'd rather be a separate nation at that point. That's when you want to get, walk away from the yeah. situation and be like, okay, well, i tell you what, guys, we've, we've warned you about this. This is disgusting. Um, it's hard. It's difficult as a Catholic to exist in this culture. I was, you know, I'm a retired teacher. Um, it, it's difficult to uh, think about the reality of what abortion is and these babies being killed. And um, it's amazing to me how this kind of uh, uh, materialistic dialectic has taken the place of God altogether. Yes. And really, in some ways, you could argue you could argue that the form of capitalism that exists in this country has done more destruction morally than communism ever could have. Because communism strengthened people's faith in those, in those bad situations. Yeah, I think you look at the evidence in Eastern Europe, something happened there under the rule of communism that sort of incubated the faith and protected it to a certain degree. Now that they're liberalized and democracy reigns over there, now the real threat comes, ironically enough. Um, but you're right, it seems like the faith was protected over there under 70 years of tyrannical rule. Um, you know, secession, I, I don't see secession happening I, I, simply because I think state governments will accommodate, the federal government is so powerful now, States don't want to get wiped out. Um, that's kind of my simplistic simplistic take on that. But I think we've reached a point in history now where, listen, we, we have no common values anymore as a people. And, and that's the biggest problem of them all. And, and the left and the progressives understand this flaw in the Constitution itself, Anthony. And they're pushing harder with alternative lifestyles. They're throwing it in our face. They got the, their allies in the media, in government, in the education system. Everything that is good and decent and of God, of the one true triune God, is under attack. Where are our allies at? 
I don't know what our classical liberals friends are waiting for. I keep hearing this notion. Well, at some point, there's got to be a religious revival at some point. And my thing is, okay, where, where have we ever seen a religious revival that's pulled us out of this kind of moral decadence? Uh, I mean, I'm sure it might have happened, you know, in the old world, but I don't remember it in modern times. Um, I, it, this is a matter of we as a people responding to God and finding faith on, uh, on our behalf in that sense. It, it's up to us to find God. And right now, God is letting us descend down into sort of this, this kind of evil that at this point in time is out of control. And what the classical liberals are proclaiming, well, we're going to have a religious revival at some point. We hear the Catholics keep telling you, we've been telling you for decades, for centuries, you've been wrong. We told you 200 years ago. You know, I pulled up, as a real quick here, an encyclical by Pope Gregory the Sixteenth in 1844, talking about the contradictions and the, dis the really the disastrous society that Protestantism and B they called it biblical societies at the time would cause. And and he goes to highlight how religious indifferentism would create nothing but chaos and confusion. And there is a ton of biblical encyclicals by the popes in the 19th century that highlight if you guys go down this path of rejecting Holy Mother Church that built up the entire Western world and go down this path of indifferentism, it's going to bring confusion, chaos, and destruction to our civilization. Anthony, we Catholics have been telling our classical liberal friends for over 200 years, you better listen to us because we, we've been around a lot longer than you. And guess what? Those popes and those Catholics of the past got exactly right while the classical liberals are... are, are are only proclaiming GDP numbers at this point because that's all they have. Yes, exactly. It all comes down to the vote now, right? So if most of your conservatives are morally not really conservative anymore, when you've got however, gosh, who knows what the percentage of men is in the conservative camp that are addicted to pornography, uh, you know, and other moral vices, you can't really make a stand against those things, can you? Because you've got to win the next election. You don't want to. You don't want to disturb the voters. So it, it just all comes down to economics at that point. Well, guess what? Eventually, even your economic pyramid collapses as well because it is dependent on right order thinking, right order moral society, and Catholic civilization had that. What the classical liberals and the Protestants opened up was Pandora's box. You can't get this thing to walk backwards. There has to be a conversion of the heart to understand what the body of Christ really is. And the body of Christ is, see, with the Protestant idea of, let's just say, no salvation out of the side of, you know, uh, well, the Protestant idea of um, salvation by faith alone. Or, you know, sola fide, you know, really, really, what does that actually do to the body of Christ? That means you can abuse your neighbors, which are a part of the body of Christ, and you can get away with it. And you can all abuse each other and get away with it. And, and you think there's going to be no, you don't have to make restitution for that. You don't think there's going to be consequences. You don't think hell is real. Why does the Bible talk so much about sin and hell? There's a reason. It's being it's not the easy road. As we, the, the, it bastardizes what the body of Christ is. The body of Christ, if, if you want to really treat your neighbor as yourself, you have to live that. You think you're going to get up to the judgment seat and God's going to look at you and be like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, I said all that stuff about loving your neighbor as yourself and, you know, all that stuff about sin, but don't worry, you abused my body. Uh, you, you can still get in. We even see at the end of the, you know, towards the end of the Bible, God himself, Jesus himself, talks about how, no, no, you know, you saw me hungry, you didn't give me anything to eat, you didn't clothe me, you didn't come see me when I was sick or in prison. So, so yeah, you had me on your lips, but you're no better than the pagan down the street, really, and that pagan down the street might stand a better chance of getting in than you. That's where uh, there's a disconnect in Protestantism, and this is uh, this is you know I understand there might be Protestants watching, 
But I'm trying, this is true charity. I'm trying to wake people up here. Because if you're really a part of the body of Christ, that means you need to go back and study and see what that was from the very beginning, historically. The Bible did not drop out of the sky. And it's the same thing with the Constitution. Everybody's got to have a book. Jesus didn't hand everybody a Bible. Old Testament Scripture, New Testament Scripture was written over a period of 400 years. And finally compiled into Scripture when the Pope decided, Pope, uh, Pope Liberius decided, hey, we need a Bible because we're having this problem with uh, all these heretics. I mean, you know, it's just... So anyway, we covered a lot here, Frank. I mean, I, I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but these things are all interconnected. It's what we talk about here tonight for Christmas all the time. Please subscribe to us at Patreon to keep this going. Um, you know, we've we need a confessional state, and that's what we hear tonight at Christendom are all about. We've got to get a confessional state, Frank, because that's the only way we get things straightened out here about this question of religion. And people know that doesn't mean that Catholics ever did any these horrible things you've heard about. We've got to have a whole show dispelling all those myths, because those things are completely untrue. The Jews themselves lived amongst Catholics freely, uh, you know, for centuries. So all the stuff that people have heard, it's just, it's a pack of lies to enforce propaganda against us. Yeah, and I think our classical liberal friends are, are uh, basically living on borrowed time, you know, despite all the claims of the most prosperous era of human history, it's all been done on record amounts of government debt, personal debt, and a bunch of funny money uh, from the Federal Reserve that we know is tinkering with the with the interest rate. That's what it's been over the past 60 years. Um, that's the irony of it all. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's number one. Number two, as we close this out, Anthony, you know, this goes back to what we've said all the time here at the Knights of Christendom. Everything really works in, in a certain order in our civilization. And, you know, I've always said that the culture is the downstream of the faith and the political system is the downstream of the culture itself. Um, America politically has gone haywire. Culturally, we're being destroyed. The family is being dissipated. And it's all because we've always refused to define eternal truths in regards to our faith and religion and really the amount of respect the one triune God is owed uh, in that respect in the light of sacred tradition. We haven't done that in America. We've refused to have that conversation. It's easier to say, well, God is good. God is love. God is wise. And God understands me. See, that's the easy peasy sort of Protestant notion mixed in with some Freemasonry that makes everybody feel comfortable so we don't have to really take on these critical issues. But let's remember our ancestors. They governed their lives for really, you know, almost 2,000 years under a certain set dictates that were passed on from generation to generation, an analogy of the faith, and this is important, an analogy of the faith that can be traced back for 2,000 years that wasn't made void by individual groups. I can trace my lineage all the way back for a long time with a consistent belief and standards that bring uniformity and ultimately truth and peace to our civilization because we've broken with that line of succession, because we've broken with the line of the truth of Holy Mother Church, Anthony, we see the chaos of modernity. Any last words, my friend? Brother, I think we've covered it all the way there and back in this episode. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I would just say, if you're Protestant, you're watching, and this is, you find this disturbing, or perhaps you're questioning things, you find yourself getting angry at what we're saying, please understand that we're not angry. I mean, what we're, we're just trying to wake people up. You know, they talk about being red-pilled. We want to tr trad-pill you. We want to give you the traditional pill. Go back and read how the early church functioned, the earliest church. Read uh, St. Ignatius of Antioch, read the other early church fathers that knew the apostles directly and had hands laid on them. This was not a Bible church. This was a church where men had hands laid on them and that authority was passed down. Jesus established a church first. You can look at it. It's historically true. The documents are there. The Catholic Church gave us the Bible for a reason. It, 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 it wasn't to be used by itself. Very well said, my friend. And while you address our Protestant brothers and sisters, I'm going to address our classical.
I'm going to address our classical liberals, brothers and sisters here. Uh, listen, this is not an attack on America. This is actually for the love of America. We all want what's best for America. We wake up every morning and see a morally decadent world going off the cliff day after day after day. And your progressive siblings, the animals you unleashed through this godless concept of freedom and liberty are approaching or encroaching on every aspect of our lives and they're dominating our civilization more and more every day and you guys have no answers anymore simply say jobs 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 and gdp numbers is not an answer okay because that soon will come to an end because of all the funny money and the games we're playing the show games in the economy and ultimately, a society without true and just morality can't survive regardless. Remember, the Roman Empire was an economically prosperous civilization, but it fell. There's been a lot of economically prosperous civilizations throughout history. But the one thing they have in common is that they were all morally bankrupt. They were all morally corrupt, which led to the collapse of their civilization. We here at the Knights of Christian love America more than you will ever know. But we want his greatest good. We want America to be healed. And the only way to do that is through Jesus Christ being proclaimed as king, not democratically elected leader, but king of the universe through Holy Mother Church. We must reject the false concepts of the Protestant reformations, which were a lie. And we must reject the godless evil enlightenment that killed our Catholic brothers and sisters in cold blood. For the freedom to justify Amen, their brother. sins. For the freedom to justify their sins. That's what the enlightenment was. Bring back the Holy Mother Church. Bring back Christ, kingship, and we will restore America. Because it's a country we love, and it's a country that we will defend its honor in out of that love. This is Frank. I want to thank Anthony for joining me tonight. Great podcast, my friend. Good night, everybody. <laughs>